Hello, and welcome to episode 84, part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for June 2019. Some people are born great. Some achieve greatness. Others have greatness thrust upon them. Some have fanboys who think they can do no wrong and have always been great. Elon. Maybe they are great. Maybe they're geniuses entirely overappreciated in their own and everyone else's time. Maybe they're just c**t with too much money. <laughs> we look about them at the poor, starving, destitute of the world and think, f**k that, I'm building me a space colony in which to live out my Isaac Asimov-induced wank fantasy, while getting me some of that thick, thick government-subsidised gravy. We all feared that the end would come with a pandemic, or maybe the inferno of a nuclear holocaust. Now we can see that the end will come when Elon decides he's done with humanity. After straining the last ounce of affirmation and praise from an ungrateful population, and after calling everyone a pedo, he will launch his fanboy army <laughs> stormtroopers to troll even as yet uncontacted tribes in the Amazon. Oh my God. After days of their vitriol, cult-like worship and incel misogyny, the UN Security Council will pass a resolution begging the nuclear powers of the planet to obliterate us in the cleansing fire of nuclear fusion. While Musk escapes in his big penis rocket, Copy a foundation in one hand and a jar of Tesla lubricant in the other. Happy days. <laughs> that is a joy. <laughs> but on we must. If all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, then I guess we should announce the cast for this fine performance. Though she be but little, she is fierce. Jenny. <sighs> and the fool doth think he is wise. Ralph. Meh. <laughs> Hello, people. How the devil are you? Oh, well. Oh, much better after that introduction. That was a very good that introduction. That was a joy to behold. <laughs> uh, and the editor, the bleeper's going to be busy again, isn't it? <laughs> it was busy very last busy. episode. It's going to be busy again. <laughs> <laughs> this goes out on 365 days of astronomy, don't you know? And uh, I don't think they take to all this uh, frivolity and, uh, and filth. Well, they do, do they know. <laughs> well, it's the summer. We're allowed something, aren't we? It's the silly season. <laughs> it's all that pim. It's the silly season. Well, nobody does astronomy in summer, so maybe nobody listens no, to astronomy in summer. No, I don't think yeah, anybody actually be. listens to this. Yeah. 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 Nah. Let's just, just imagine nobody's listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they've been up to much? Oh, in the last uh, ten minutes since we finished the previous episode. <laughs> Just don't reveal. <laughs> I've urinated and had a banana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've done. I've done much the same. I've just, just picked myself up another beer. Would you know? It's actually a lager. Oh wow! Look at mm. that. Sidonia's finest. Someone left. No, it's Estrella. Oh, oh. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Someone left one in our fridge, and I thought, well, I'll have that. Go on. <laughs> it's cold. So you're drinking the dregs from your own fridge. I'm drinking. <laughs> I'm drinking the cast-off lager from Barcelona that's been clogging up my fridge. Oh, do you, do you know? You've just reminded me of Teen Fuel, the the um, the drinks that we used to have when we were teenagers, Paul. Castaways and Blastaways. Do you remember oh, those? Oh God, yeah. Heady days. Oh, hooch. Those were the days. Oh, hooch. Mad Dog 2020. Yeah. Thunderbird oh. fortified wine. Yeah, God, our yeah. kids have got it easy today with their alco pops, haven't they? Yeah. What about what about a bit of Bucky? Bucky. Oh, book min- book f- book full of Minster Buck Smithereen Fastly. wines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I've got a Bulmers. Ah, oh, it's so. That's class. my uh, contribution, which is actually uh, cider left over from a conference, and they let all the poor PhD students take what was left. Excellent. Cool. That's good. I bet that was like flies to a turd. Yeah. Oh yeah, and they also let us take home the leftover food every day. So I basically lived off sandwiches for a week. It was great. It'd be like survival <laughs> of the fittest. One sandwich on the floor, a load of PhD students, and then the last one surviving gets the sandwich. If you picture Hunger Games, I'm I'm just yeah. imagining I'm just imagining this plate of sandwiches you've got on your kitchen table, and by the end of the week, it's like the cheese ones are like were these blue at the beginning of the week? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember they're being stilted. <laughs> Uh, right, well, emails. Do we have some emails? 
We do. And the first one comes from um, our good friend Anonymous in California. Um, <laughs> he, he, he often writes into us. <laughs> Anonymous, yeah, but it kind of seems like it's from a different person each time. It, uh, he comes but, from a different play. He moves around a lot. Yeah, yeah busy guy. Um, and he, he points out that in May 2019, part two, it was mentioned that oxygen is very flammable or uh, inflammable yes. for yes, those it's who not. want to confuse yeah. everything. This is a common error, akin to the dark side of the mm. moon, that all professionals should assiduously, thanks spell check for the assist, avoid. Methane, oh sorry, methane, not methane, does not smell either. Another pet peeve. I deal with it and gases that actually do smell. Oxygen is an oxidizer. Fancy that. Oxidizers, by definition, are not flammable. Fuels are flammable. If one strikes a match of a chamber of 100% oxygen, the oxygen does not go whoosh. The match may vaporise quite rapidly, but no boom. Fair play, um, Mr Anonymous. Um, it's true. It's yeah. true. Yep. Um, yeah, it's true. We were being lazy, but it is methane. Although methane, methane, yeah. yeah take your That's pick. another tomato, really tomato thing, right? Yeah. 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 Sorry, say- sorry, Anonymous in California. We will continue to say methane just as we say tomatoes. You- yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, and we also had a good email from our good friend Sirloin. That might be a made-up name, or he may just be partial to cheaper cuts of steak. Uh, <laughs> Sir Loin is of no declared location, but he says, Greetings and salutations, Martian overlords and Jen, the queen of outer space. Why are ah, people doing you. this? Why, why do people do this? Because I'm the best. Suck it up, Ralph. <sighs> We're going to have to, aren't we? While talking about the Lagrangian point L3, Jen jokingly made an off-the-cuff remark about how maybe there's a planet there. In the TV show Lex, there was. More specifically, there was a binary planet system the planets of water and fire that were ultimately revealed to be heaven and hell. Just thought <gasps> spoilers! I'd say that. Oh, yeah. spoilers! It, has anyone heard of Lex? Nope. I, no, I, I don't re- either. I've never watched it, but I, I knew of it. It's one of those, hmm. uh, I saw it and thought, oh, that probably looks quite good. No, I never watched it. He also mm-hmm. says that the Dumbbell Nebula reminds him of the spinning cube in the Corbomite manoeuvre, which to me sounds like something that isn't for before the watershed. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, perform the Bukaki (laughs) manoeuvre. And it must follow as the night, the day we move to the news. Jenny. My first story for this month is possibly some bad news about the future of manned space travel. Uh, mm. uh. Uh, these are the results of a study on the joints of mice now back in 2013 half a dozen mice spent a month living on Russia's Beyond M1 spacecraft and samples of their cartilage were collected recently researchers from the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit studied these samples alongside some comparison samples taken from mice kept on the ground in the same conditions the control mice as it were the team found that the mice that had spent the time in space had degraded joint tissue compared to the control team. Now, worryingly, it was the same sort of degradation that can lead to osteoarthritis in humans. And they believe the root cause of this is the lack of loading on the cartilage because of the almost complete absence of gravity in space. That's fine. We just won't send mice into space. No. Hang on. Can I just say, we're going to get emails. Look, we've, we've had the whole oxygen oxidizer thing. Mm. complete absence of gravity in space oh microgravity gem no there's loads of gravity it's all about the it's all about the orbits and the speeds and the cancelling it out there's as much gravity on the ISS as there is down here and all that oh, okay but only a pedant would write in to tell us because that. of the lack of effects of gravity mm. in space better moving on Do you, you did raise a good point though Ralph can we expect a similar sort of damage to a cure yeah my God, I can't speak tonight. <laughs> that is the question. Can we expect a similar sort of damage to occur in humans? The answer? <clears throat> don't know. Because these are mice. Mice does not equal human. So don't send mice to space. It's fine. What this study has done is highlighted the importance of examining astronauts for this sort of effect. Because bones and muscles are routinely tested and checked. But cartilage is not... Oh, good point. Yes. So this is the importance of the study. And the other important thing 
is that bones and muscles are pretty good at repairing themselves. Cartilage is not. Uh, no, it isn't, is it? Mm. So, hmm. something to think about for those uh, long old trips to Mars. Yeah, you don't want your nose falling off. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone go a bit status quo. <laughs> That's all right. Just do what Kepler did. Was it Kepler who had the golden nose? Who was it? Oh, Tycho, Tycho Brahe, wasn't Tycho, it? Tycho, yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. That was the guy who had the golden nose. Hmm. Everyone had golden Silver. nose. Daniela Westbrook. Daniela Westbrook had a golden nose. <laughs> oh, no, she had uh, no, yeah. Koki Septum, wasn't it? <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving on swiftly, but sticking with the theme of space and biology... My second short news story um, is the announcement of a cool experiment which is due to kick off next year. NASA are planning to send living things into deep space. Mice. The first time since 1972. Not mice. Pigs. Not pigs. Taco Brahi. <laughs> I mean, if he was still alive, he's got a lot of questions to answer. Daniela Westbrook. I mean, she one is still day, alive, but no. One day they will send pigs just so someone in mission control, as the rocket takes off, they can scream, Pigs, pigs in space! <laughs> Again, another reference. I do not understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you not ever think it's weird, Jen, that you just, you hang out a lot with a couple of old guys? <laughs> yeah, I do. I question it every time we record. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay you broadened my horizons it's fine it's fine <laughs> so tell us about these pigs in space or daniela westbrook in space or whatever it is all right well i'm gonna disappoint you because it's not gonna be pigs no it's not even gonna be fruit flies it's okay. gonna be yeast <laughs> <laughs> that's disappointing oh they're aiming low <laughs> it is to see if bread will in rise in space, space. Uh, so we're talking about BioSentinel, um, which is going to be sent uh, in orbit around the sun. It's very small, about the size of a small suitcase or a briefcase, laptop bag, something like that. Um, they're going to be exposed to the harsh radiation of uh, space, that, that radiation that exists beyond our magnetosphere, um, for up to a year. And this information is going to be really important for when we do extended stays in places that are outside of our protective magnetosphere, like the moon or even mars there's going to be a twin of this mission put up on the space station which has much lower radiation levels um compared to sort of deep space as it were deep space um and there's also going to be two more samples down on earth one is going to be exposed to enormous amounts of radiation just like the one in deep space and then the other one is going to be left to its own devices And between all four samples, the scientists should be able to rule out effects that are caused by microgravity, um, effects caused by radiation, things like that. Now you're probably thinking, why yeast? Because yeast sounds really boring. But the mechanisms that are used by yeast to repair DNA are uncannily similar to those used by humans. So the results of this work could have really dire consequences for long-term space travel. Uh-huh. They missed. They missed the opportunity. It's all I could think after you told me it was yeast. They should have called the mission Thrush. <laughs> I mean, it they, did they go could... through my mind. I thought, can I make the comment? So maybe they are selling, sending Daniela up. But I thought, no, I can't because that's really rude. <laughs> they, they, they could have. I mean, you know, crap acronyms. They're really good at that. They could have made an acronym fit for us. Of course they could. <laughs> they could have done that. That would have been awesome. <laughs> and it's not like Daniela is going to listen to this anyway, so... No, I know, exactly. If she does, we'll soon know. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Ralph. Ralph. Oh, OK. Um, so, rounding up the space exploration news... Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, rounding up the space exploration news, I'll get the downer out of the way first. There's no methane on Mars. Um, You might remember we reported in an earlier show that the European Space Agency's latest sniffing tool, the Trace Gas Orbiter, despite being far more sensitive than anything before it, has been unable to verify the methane that was detected on Mars by um, the Mars Express and Mars Curiosity. And we want to find methane on Mars because this would be caused either by active geology or life. So where have you two guys been hiding it? Well, 
Well, what we do is we bottle it and then we inhale it. Mm. <laughs> you just bottle it and burn it, right? Yes, let's say that. <laughs> yeah. No, we only do that with the methane. Yeah, the oh. methane. The methane we inhale. Ah, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> But sadly, in a, a Nature paper last month, researchers state we did not detect any methane over a range of latitudes in both hemispheres, obtaining an upper limit for methane of about 0 0.05 parts per billion by volume, which is 10 to 100 times lower than previously reported positive detections. So, mm. no methane of note, and we now ask, why did Mars Express and Curiosity detect it? Mm. Mm. So, one, one thing solved... Um, another thing opens up as a question, which is cool, mm. and that's science, isn't it? In other news, NASA have now released their 2020 budget amendment, asking Congress for an additional $1.6 billion on top of the original $21 billion budget to accelerate NASA's return to the moon under the newly minted Project Artemis. I like that name. Good, isn't it? Artemis like was the twin sister of Apollo, of course, and goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. The project aims to return astronauts to the moon's south pole by 2024, including the first woman and the next man. Ooh, there's always a token. <laughs> there's always a token. Na uh, just like this show. Mm. NASA say that they will be able to... Uh, that, that got less of a laugh than I was expecting. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, you didn't really give us the opportunity to laugh. You just kind of ploughed <laughs> on. I think you said it, and then your brain sort of went, oh, shit, and then you carried on. And I had a mouthful of fish cake, so I couldn't not. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, God, that went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> no, I'd, I tried to laugh, but I had a mouthful of fish and prawn. Well, thanks for trying. <laughs> yeah, I tried. <laughs> NASA say they'll be able to establish a sustainable human presence on the moon by 2028 to uncover new scientific discoveries, demonstrate new technological advancements, and lay the foundation for private companies to build a lunar economy. Paul says, we're going back to the moon and God darn it if we're not going to take one of those blasted females with us. <laughs> but this time we're, we're going to take a bloody woman with us, don't you know? <laughs> we're into the women. We, 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 we don't mind the women. We'll take the women with us. <laughs> that, that, would, that would be the UK Space Agency's version. Yeah. <laughs> those, 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 what are they called? What are they called? You know, um, the ones with the, the, the funny, you know... Women. The ones That's without it. the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the uh, yes, yes, the, 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 huge, the huge tracts of land. They're, they're, they're good at stuff. They're good at stuff now. We <laughs> need, <laughs> we need someone to make us sandwiches. God damn it! They vote and drive and all sorts these days. Yeah, my, my driver even says they got the bloody vote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure as long as they've got somebody on the maps, they could make their way to the moon. <laughs> but of course, I suppose like every every NASA plan and every NASA project to get back to the moon, this the success of this or otherwise is going to lie in the money. So mm. back to the budget. In addition to the Lunar Gateway, which we'll discuss later in the show, this budget makes provision for $90 million for increased robotic exploration of the moon's polar region in advance of a human mission. 132 million for technologies for key human survival capabilities in advance of human landings on the surface, and this will include exploration technologies like solar electric propulsion and a polar ice to water conversion demonstrator. 651 million for finishing NASA's heavy lift rocket, the Space Launch System, or SLS, and the Orion capsule to get astronauts into lunar orbit and one billion to go towards accelerating the development of a commercial lunar lander to take astronauts from lunar orbit to the surface of the moon. Of course, Jeff Bezos has already created one, so they could just mm. spend that billion on sandwiches, I guess. I will point <laughs> out mm. that they've asked for an extra 1.6 billion. Yeah. The numbers that you've just quoted add up to more than that. You and your maths. That's why they don't let women go to the moon. Always mm. picking on things. <laughs> <sighs> Poking holes, that's what I do. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> I should have checked the maths on that one. They don't add up. They don't even come close. <laughs> no, they don't. They could do the last two bits, almost. <laughs> Not the first two bits, so. Um, I think they'll just ask their mates, right? That's what men do. Yeah, of course. Never read the instructions. 
<laughs> um, more money is going to be expected to be asked for in the 2021 budget and successive budgets as these activities ramp up. And the good news for everyone that isn't a moon freak is that no other NASA programs are going to be cut as part of this budget request. The relevant House Appropriations Committee marked up its funding bill to meet these demands and the Senate will take up its own version of these bills in the coming months. So no guarantees by any means, but it's a plan, a strategy and a request for funds from a Senate with the same political stripes as the White House. So it's mm. yeah, it's not looking too bad. Yeah. It's, it's exciting times. Mm, it is. So, Lunar Gateway, mm. our big story. Mm. Because this, it feels like at the moment, every few days, something else is coming out of NASA that is just yeah. kind of shaking the tree and, and, and moving things along mm. much quicker than we were expecting. Yeah. And here we are with Lunar Gateway. Yeah. So what's Lunar Gateway? We've, we've talked about this before, but it, we, we, now, we now seem to know what it is and, and mm. how it's going to work. It's NASA's next big boondoggle. It is the International Space Station in orbit around the moon. And what a waste of time that was the first time around. Oh. Why do we need to have a staging post around the moon? Buzz Aldrin even asked that question. But um, yeah, basically, it's, a, it's an orbital laboratory and staging post for so that astronauts don't have to just put the capsule in orbit around the moon and then descend from that they can go over to the they can get into lunar orbit dock with this lunar gateway and um, and replenish or pick up extra supplies or that's where they'll have rovers and all sorts of things that can go down to the surface and probably a lot of autonomous um, robotic ideas that they'll put down on the surface but to, to my mind, it seems a little unnecessary. I don't know. I think it's a nice idea. It's going to sink a lot of funds. Yeah, but it'll be there, and it'll be a a, a sort of anchor point for for mission. The problem, the, the massive problem of Apollo, was it was a there and back again. Yeah. Mm. You 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 didn't stay, and here is we know we can live in orbit. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. The ISS has been in orbit for you know over twenty years now, and, and there's nothing there's been... sexy about doing orbit at low Earth orbit, but it's a bit sexier doing it around the moon. Yeah, <laughs> partly, but it, I think it, I think it's important because it's also that sort of rather than dragging everything to the moon every time you want to go and land on it, you have it there. So all you got to do is send a crew, and then I bet you they can also send. Um like unmanned missions that will go just to resupply it yeah exactly i bet and you they'll do stuff like that although it will stop- also be solar electric propulsion as well so that'll be renewable energy mm. but what would be interesting is you'll be able to control you won't have to constantly land on the moon but you'll be able to control um buggies and, and things like that from the lunar gateway without and ex- delay explore the surface without any kind of delay because you'll be right there above them Mm, but then it's only one and a half second delay from the Earth. So yeah. does that really matter that much? Yeah, but it's building up the tech to do this around things like Mars. Yeah. We, th- this whole lunar thing is 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 kind of... It's a thing in itself because we should explore the moon. But it's also... This is like the massive dress rehearsal for doing this around Mars. Mm. Yeah, I just hope that the whole Project Artemis doesn't end up being dependent on the Lunar Gateway because it's going to sink so much money. And I don't it just so. seems an additional extra. Yeah, I think it will do. I think it will do. It will become completely dependent on it. It will be it'll be the staging post to all the, the, the surface missions. Even even the first one in 2024? They'll hop down to the surface before the Gateway's finished. Oh, I'm sure. But once once in terms of the sustainability, Gateway will have a lander and it will be reusable. Yeah, it'll be like like a lift up and down to the surface. Yeah. I guess. It's almost like you park your car there, right? Well, like when you go shopping, you park your car in the park, car park, and then you get the lift down to the shops, right? Yeah, exactly. The car park is the gateway, and then the little shuttle on board the gateway will be your lift down to the moon. Mm-hmm. BFR, fraction of the cost. And they can have, like, backups on the gateway so if whatever they're using to get back up off the surface of the moon fails there can be people on board the gateway prepared to send a second backup one down to go and fetch people mm-hmm. so it just adds another kind mm. of safety net right yep yeah 
And if anything goes wrong, whatever, you know, someone's spacesuit develops a leak or whatever, they could probably send a spear down or take them straight back up to the to the gateway where they'll be safe. In a matter of hours rather than days. Yeah. And then they exactly. can be, you know, if someone gets injured, they can go back up there, be stabilised and then sent home rather than having to, you know, bleed all over the spaceship as they're travelling <laughs> back. <laughs> Oh, can you imagine that? You don't want little droplets of vomit and like shit and blood floating everywhere, do you? I often think whenever you see those pictures of the the frogman lifting open the Apollo capsule after it's just landed after oh, the three, smell. four days in space, the stink as they open that hatch. Can <laughs> you imagine? Oh, mm. Ooh, do you reckon they had one of those little Christmas tree air fresheners just dangling? God, you would hope so. <laughs> well, I, I imagine you'd have one like actually taped to your nose as you open the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> That's they weren't pumping in oxygen; they were pumping in air freshener. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, on the sort of back of this and this whole idea of of the the, the lunar exploration, there was a leaked picture uh, which we got hold of. Um, Ew, sneaky, sneaky! Are you going to mention the provenance? And no, um, and <laughs> um, this is was an internal. Uh, for NASA only picture. Uh, it, it does actually say for NASA internal use only. It does indeed. Yeah. It does indeed. It comes I up. Like yes, I think it. it is now. It's now in the public domain. We got this when it wasn't, um, and so it's an integrated exploration manifest, 2019 to 2024, um, and this is the suggested um, sort of route to 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 the moon and how they're going to land on the moon and what they're going to do and the numbers of missions. Uh, mm-hmm. And it actually takes it right up to 2028, in fact. It uses SLS. And so it's a series of missions. Um, there's the robotic missions they've talked about. The first one, I mean, actually, they're l- looking at one, an opportunity in 2019, so this year. Um, and then a, basically a robotic mission every single year, including one. Now, I'm sure they've just used the image. But one of the missions in 2023 looks very much like a... Um, Curiosity rover. Curiosity mm. rover. Using that. So that's 2023. Then um, they've got that big yellow block, 2024. Um, they, they're looking at one, two, three, four, five missions that year, including, mm-hmm. is it very clear, it says human lunar lander or human lunar yep. landing. And there's a picture of... of of the suspiciously looking Blue Origin style lander there. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so it includes robotic missions and, and look, pre-missions. Um, there's three missions and then there's what they've listed as EM3, which we now know is going to be, I think, Artemis 3. Yes. So if it all goes to plan, whereas we talk about Apollo 11, we are in the future also going to be talking about Artemis, Artemis 3. Artemis 3, yeah, the return. Could could be that that big name that big name and number mm. that that kind of sits in the history books mm. so but then is that lander gonna have people on it yes yes human yes, lunar landing yeah that is that is the plan that's why that that block on this this integrated exploration manifest is all in that sort of key color that's the the goal year you've had em uh one late 2020 early 21 uh which is the first sls mission um, then EM2 2022 then EM3 in 2024 um, I will it, say um, that's not yeah. a lot of launches before no, they start sending people no no it really really isn't um, it, it's really really interesting I'm highly sceptical but you know we as we said they, 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 they're put it, trying to put this budget through they now presented a plan um, and then it continues 2025 landing 2026 landing 2027 landing and then 2028 is where they're talking about these um, sustained landings and there's stuff with the lunar gateway in there and there's modules launched and um, in total there's one where are we one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty 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 tw
and I think it, it cropped up before the Artemis name um, appeared. Yeah. But there we are. Um, so very, very exciting times. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, they really do seem to be going for it. Everyone doubted them. And everyone was like, nah, 2024 is crazy. But they have a plan. It's on I, paper. I honestly think the key one is going to be 12, 18 months time. What, that first SLS lo- rocket Artemis, launch? Artemis, Artemis 1. The Artemis 1 launch. If that happens and it goes to plan and 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 all works, I think that... And, and that they've actually budgeted it, and it's 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 been built and launched and goes. Then I think they're on they're on their way. If there's delay in that, if it doesn't happen as this plan suggests, then I don't think there's much chance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go with that. I, I think that that's that's the sort of key thing, is that they've got to get that first launch, and it's got to be kind of on on time, on budget, and it's got to work without delay. Right then, should we have a debate? Yeah. Why not? Order! The court will come to order. So this is the first hearing of the best space mission thus far. Right then, what do we have before us first? Council, if you please. My lord, I'd like to approach the bench and then advocate on behalf of my client, the cassini Huygens Space Research Mission. Uh, Please proceed, please proceed. And so it was that on or about the evening of October the 15th, 1997, a plutonium-laden spacecraft weighing in excess of six tonnes was taken from its perfectly fine resting place and propelled into the harsh vacuum of space and then forcefully inserted into the immense radiation fields of the sixth planet from the sun. Not only injurious to the defendant, but the said defendant was also with child. In its (gasps) belly was a delicate little child that would go on to greatness as the only ever emissary of the planet Earth to land and take images from the surface of a moon around another planet. But don't take my word for it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear the words of the defendants themselves. Many members of the public appealed for justice for Cassini Huygens in this noble forum, but here are some of the arguments put forward. Duncan Hamilton, who can be found on Twitter as at space underscore geek, tells the court, This spacecraft did amazing science over its life, lasting 20 years, working almost flawlessly in space until it was deliberately destroyed in Saturn's atmosphere in 2017. It's an amazing achievement and makes it worthy of being in your top missions. When it arrived in orbit in 2004, it made some amazing discoveries and sent back absolutely stunning photos. Not only will the science it produced have a lasting effect, but these photos will have a lasting effect as they have inspired many young minds into astronomy and science. As for the science, it discovered many things, but some highlights include... Icy plumes and liquid water on Enceladus, discovering a Trojan moon around Dione, landing the Huygen probe on Titan, discovering methane lakes on Titan, hexagonal structure of Saturn's North Pole, explaining the two-tone nature of Iapetus. Hope this rambling has supported the Cassini mission to make the top ten. Keep up the great podcast. Love the newish format of two episodes a month. Objection! Playing to the gallery. Uh, objection sustained. Please do you keep the gratuitous fawning to a minimum, Mr. Wilkins. Very well, my lord. Moving on to Ms. Julia Reimer Brooker of Colorado, USA, who, and if it pleases the court, appeals to her Martian overlords and Welsh Queen Jen. Despite being from the colonies, Ms. Reimer graciously acknowledges that her vote for the best space mission ever does not involve 20 plus years of manned spacewalks or interstellar travel, but nonetheless, she believes it to be one of the greatest in terms of science and beauty and poetry. She appeals to the court's greater wisdom and kinder heart that as an artist, the visual image has a bit more impact on her than pure data. And she very kindly proposes for this five succinct reasons. 
Saturn is gorgeous, and with Cassini we have been able to see it in its full glory from all its best angles. The Huygens lander onto Titan is incredible and deserves its own five-part list. A spacecraft that flies in between the planet and rings is a feat of engineering one must admire. The poetry of the great Carolyn Porco's The Day the Earth Smiled in 2013. And in a moment of typical American informality and recklessness with the English language structure and convention, I appeal to the court to forgive. Ms. Reimer concludes, all the sciencing. <coughs> We've learned a lot about this planet and now have more questions, like what's up with the hexagon? I'm curious to hear what everyone else votes for. Love your podcast. I've learned and laughed a lot from it. My lord! My learned friend has been warned about gratuitous flattery as a tactic. <laughs> indeed, indeed, my apologies. May it please the court to move swiftly to Mr. Nathan Day. Cassini was a marvel of technology and engineering. It operated for almost 20 years, performing at a high level and returning an enormous amount of data on one of the wonders of our solar system, Saturn. I'm enclosing a picture of Saturn I took from my house in July 2018 as a subliminal influence to pick Cassini. May this picture be entered into the record, the court record, as Exhibit 1. Thank you for providing such an educational and entertaining podcast. And uh, Mr. Wilkins, you're not helping your client with this shameful repetition of praise. Obliged, my lord. Then I would like to take this opportunity to remind you of the burden of proof. The court of Sidonia brings this case for Cassini, and it is for the court to prove it. The defendant need not prove anything. That said, John Massini, who I have cause to believe hails from the United States of America, says, Cassini has brought us beautiful images of the planet Saturn and returned information we otherwise wouldn't have known about, Enceladus in particular, while Mr. Ben Harding, who does not to the court's knowledge come from or reside in Dover, concludes with, Saturn is so beautiful and so interesting and Cassini has shown it in amazing detail. So if you merely suspect or have a hunch that Cassini is the more spectacular mission, then you must return a verdict stating so, my lord. Okay, thank you, counsel. You may sit. Um, proceed. If it please the bench, I would now like to present arguments for my client, the infallible New Horizons. Indeed, do continue. Whilst we can all agree that Cassini was indeed extraordinary and won the hearts of professional and amateur astronomers alike, inspiring a generation to look at the sky. Uh, uh, I'll remind Miss Millard that the New Horizons is your client, not Cassini. Duly noted, Your Honour, but I do have a point. Uh, proceed. As I was saying, Cassini did inspire a generation, but not my generation, not this generation. The generation that are the future of the space industry that will shape our future view of the universe. For us, our Cassini is New Horizons. New Horizons was launched some 13 years ago, January the 19th, 2006 to be precise. What was the world like back then? We were obsessed with Star Wars lightsabers, remote controlled Daleks and Cybermen masks. We were fully geared up for something extraordinary something almost out of a science fiction book to happen. And it did. Scientists decided to launch a telescope at a planet, for remember, it was still a planet back then. So faint and small and far away, that even the best telescopes around could make out nothing more than a few fuzzy pixels. The best thing? Part of the computing system on board was made of something we were all very familiar with. A PlayStation 1. Imagine, if you will, you're 12 years old, gearing up to play Crash Bandicoot, knowing that out there was the same thing flying through space, ready to tackle an almost impossible task, a flyby of the furthest rock from the sun. Now, if that wouldn't inspire the court and the bench to know more about space, I don't know what would. What would New Horizons find? A scarred, cratered, battered world. A smooth, unblemished surface. Ice. Mountains. Valleys. We had no idea. We had to wait a long time to find out. Nine whole years. And in that time we grew up. But we never forgot. 
and New Horizons knew that. And she did not disappoint. And neither did we. New Horizons came of age in a world much different than the one she had left behind. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the playground of the generation she came from. She showed us a new world, and we showed her to the world. Never before had such a mission captivated the world in such an accessible way. New Horizons opened our eyes to a dwarf planet in everyone's hearts. As John Masinda stated, New Horizons brought us images of two objects we could never have seen otherwise, and in unparalleled detail, may I add. Ben Harding of Earth also rightly pointed out that New Horizons turned the astronomy world on its head. She showed us that everything ever written about Pluto before was wrong. The astounding youth of some of the surfaces on Pluto, the lower than predicted atmospheric escape rate, water ice oceans on Sharon and Pluto, all the satellites being the same ages, changing our view of Kuiper Belt object formation, the colours of the surface, the largest known glacier in the solar system, a blue atmosphere. Science entirely only possible with new horizons. And if that wasn't enough to convince the bench, I'd like to remind the Honourable Judge of Ultima Thule, the mysterious snowman-shaped Kuiper Belt object which is unravelling theories of planet formation and shocking scientists with the existence of water and organic molecules on its surface, itself impacting theories of life elsewhere. Your Honour, New Horizons is still hurtling through space at some 33,000 miles an hour, the fastest man-made object in space to date. She is our eyes on a part of our solar system we could only strain to see with handfuls of fuzzy pixels before. Her data is lifting the veil on the most mysterious corners of our backyard, in a generation more connected than ever before. New Horizons is timely, exciting, and her impact on the general public will be like nothing you can imagine, just as her view is. I rest my case. Uh, no, order, order, <laughs> order. Well, this is this is a most difficult decision, uh, and I I really feel I should retire to my chambers. Um, but um, let's have a relevant question from uh, 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 somebody else and talk about that while I consider the verdict. Right, so our question this week is from our good friend Andrew Burns in the UK who was listening to the news story, our last astronomy show about the image of the supermassive black hole in M87 and we said its temperature was 6 billion Kelvin. And Andy asks, random question, is 6 billion, it says degree, I assume it's been Kelvin. Right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter, question. what's 273 <laughs> yeah. between friends, right? <laughs> Hey, we've got people writing about methane and methane, and I mean, come on. <laughs> Random question. Is 6 billion degree stroke Kelvin matter still a plasma? So can we have a primer on plasma? Yes. Ralph. So plasmas are formed when gases are heated to searing temperatures, either by natural processes or artificially using colliders or lasers in labs. So it's not surprising that the collapse of gases into immense gravity wells, like stars, is the most common source of plasma we see in the universe, especially if you're an astronomer. Now, what separates plasma from a gas is more fundamental than just the temperature. The atoms in the gas either gain or lose electrons to become ionised, which makes a charged particle plasma. And it's the recombination of these electrons creating UV photons, which are then absorbed by the coating of the cells in a TV screen to create visible light photons, and that's the basis of plasma screen TVs. But in stars, the plasma needs to leave the violent proximity of the star to return to being a gas, as plasma is electrically conductive, so it responds strongly to magnetic and electric fields. That means it gets looped up in the magnetic field lines of stars, which gives us those beautiful filaments we see in solar scopes. 
But coming to your question, Andy, is the six billion degrees matter on the event horizon of a supermassive black hole still plasma? Well, in 2012, engineers at the U.S. Department for Energy's Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California used lasers to create what's called hot, dense matter from aluminium samples, and they created plasma hotter than anything on Earth at 3.6 million degrees. But that's still 1,600 times cooler than the region in question. So step forward the LHC, showing that finding the Higgs or searching for new particles isn't the only thing it's good for. Because yeah. also in 2012... CERN's Large Iron Collider experiment created what's called a quark-gluon plasma, a state of matter that's only ever existed before for 10 millionths of a second after the universe's birth, at a whopping 5.5 trillion degrees for a fraction of a second. Therefore, at 916 times the temperature around the M87 supermassive black hole, we now know that superheated gas at 6 billion degrees most decidedly can still be a plasma. Awesome. Cool. That's a good question. Nice one, it. Mm. Yeah. Took Pretty a bit thoughtful. of research, but it was nice and easy to work it to figure it out. Yeah. That was a great question. Yeah. Oh, thanks to those good guys at CERN. Mm. What it's for. Right. So, come on, my lord. Right. What's the verdict? Order. Order. The court will come to order again. I have retired to consider my verdict, and it is a difficult one. But I rule in favour of New Horizons. Dash! Shit! No. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, no, wow. I've got Cassini out. <laughs> Cassini's gone. Oh, boy. Right, I thought you said you were going to pick one that was, uh, that was obviously going to get ruled out, Jen. We've lost Cassini. <laughs> I didn't think New Horizons was going to win against Cassini. Um, in in my my summary of my judgment, um, we have a continuing mission that has completely destroyed the field of planetary formation. Has visited two of the most remote objects in the solar system. Revealed objects we have never seen before. Um, the mission continues. It's the fastest spacecraft ever launched, um, and frankly. This judge was getting a bit bored with images of Saturn, frankly. <laughs> well, there we have it. So that evidence didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, so, my learned friend. A very worthy opponent. Ah, uh, indeed, indeed. Thank you for the battle, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how they talk good in sir. court. <laughs> <laughs> a very brave damsel. <laughs> <laughs> my lord I thank you for the opportunity that was a, it was a damn good argument it was I <laughs> halfway through that I was thinking oh f <laughs> I thought this, I thought this was a walk was in the like... park I'd have tried a bit harder if I'd have known <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got halfway through I was like yeah do you know what I'm completely convinced by this this is a good argument this is actually I'd never really thought about New Horizons that way yeah it's a great <laughs> argument this is a really amazing mission <laughs> And that was the point of the debate. Shit. And there you have it. I've totally missed out on career politics. <laughs> Blow wind and crack your cheeks. For it is time that this carnage was swept away. And do get involved in the show by sending us your astronomy or space-related thoughts to read out at the beginning of the show or questions to answer on astronomy and space exploration by sending an email to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. If it sparks a debate or gets us excited, it goes in the show. And go on. Give us a like, a review. Gold star. Free coffee. Gin. Well, tea for me. Don't like coffee wherever you feel like to show your appreciation because ultimately we do it for the praise so until next time it's goodbye from Cydonia Base Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution we promote general science, astronomy space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com If you want us to read your comments out on the show send us your views, opinions 
questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.